Okay, we're going to have a look now at um, our feedback of the of going through the half yearly. Um, and looking at the multiple choice first. So let's go through the, through the multiple choice. Okay, now we've got to be very careful of physics word salad. Word salad is a lot of physics jargon, sounds great, but it's total um, rubbish. Okay, if you put enough <coughs> words together, you can impress the unin uninformed, but at the same time, you can just be saying nothing. So which option correctly um, describes the concept of escape velocity? So there should be at least one distractor here that you can get rid of quite quickly and quite um, uh, ridiculously. Um, let's have a look at D as the most ridiculous object as a distractor here. The velocity an object needs to be given to cancel the effects of gravity. Can gravity be cancelled by anything? No, it's an inherent force within the universe. You can't undo gravity. There is no such thing as anti-gravity. Okay, so gravity exists. We have to overcome it at times if we want to leave the planet, but um, we can't cancel. We can't get rid of gravity. Gravity does not suddenly <coughs> magically disappear. If we could, we could fly and we could just, you know, we wouldn't need aircraft. So let's go through A, B and C. The velocity an object needs to be given on the Earth's surface to escape completely from its gravitational field. B, the velocity an object needs to be given to at launch to enter a geostationary orbit at an infinite distance from the Earth. And C, the velocity an object needs to be given to escape the frictional effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if we, this is actually quite a bad three question. If you're awake, you should be able to know this one. Has escape velocity got anything to do with geostationary orbits? No. And a geostationary orbit is not an infinite distance away. It's 35,000 kilometers away from the surface of the Earth. Um, C, the velocity of an object needs to be given the frictional effects of atmosphere. That's um, harping to orbital decay. It's got nothing to do with escape velocity. So this one here was a warm up, and obviously it's just meant to be A. Okay, so there's our warm up. This is the one that we require a lot of um, thought about. Okay, it's no longer just got a few variables. We've got five things that we have to look at. But some of them you'll have a look and go, oh yes, I can easily determine these and so on. So a satellite is in a stable circular orbit around the Earth. The satellite now comes closer to the Earth, decreases its altitude. Which of the table of what row of the table? identifies the properties which will change and how they change, I should say. Okay, so let's have a look at what we've got here. So here is our Earth, there is our satellite, and now it's down here at a different orbit. Okay, firstly, let's have a look. As it goes from down here to here, do, do we have a, a stronger gravitational pull on this object as it moves, as, as it's down? Yes, it's got a stronger gravitational acceleration at this point than this point. So what will increase? Weight will go up. Okay. We know that an object which is further away, just like the planet um, Neptune and Saturn, they are further away from the sun. They go around the sun very, very slowly. We know Mercury goes around the sun quite rapidly, and yet days. So the closer you are in, to the object, um, to the Earth, the quicker you are going to orbit, don't we know that? So which of these two objects, the this one here, or the one in the higher orbit, will have a, a faster orbit? Mm -hmm. Right, so this one, orbital velocity will increase. If orbital velocity increases, that means the time taken to go around the Earth is shortened. So what will decrease? The period. So really those two can be done in one way. But we've also just said that the orbital velocity increases, so what will happen to the kinetic in, um, energy? It, it will also increase. So we're left with gravitational potential energy. To do gravitational potential energy, we have a look at the formula. The only thing that's changing in this formula is R. Okay? Now, the R is on the bottom of a fraction. 
So if r was to go smaller, because r is decreasing, there is r, r was bigger, it's now smaller. If you decrease the bottom of a fraction, what do you do to the entire fraction? Right, it increases. But don't forget about this. Okay? So it is decreasing, even though it's increased the size of um, EP, gravitational potential energy, the magnitude has increased, but it's, it's an increase in the negative direction. So remembering our, our, um, our graph of EP against R, at an infinite distance away, R becomes, EP becomes zero. So you've moved it from here to here. So it gets a decrease in gravitational potential energy. It goes down. Okay? So gravitational potential energy has decreased. Which one of these actually is possible? It is option C. Yeah? Um, I think the other option would have been D as the, because if you got this the one wrong way around, you get these two the wrong way around. And that was the only thing there um, as to do with the negative. Negatives are hard to work with, so you've got to be careful about that one. Okay, who got caught by that, by the way? Yeah. Right, okay, so that's, that's what they're looking for there. Okay. Right, the next one here, a cannon situated on level ground launches a cannonball at an angle of 15 to the horizontal at a velocity of... At 56, there are three statements below. The time of flight is that, the maximum height is 10.7, and the range is 100. Which of the statements um, are, the, are correct? Well, you've got to work out all three. Hopefully, you'll work out one which is rubbish straight away. So we don't know. We need at least two of them correct. Okay, so we've got to find one which is incorrect. This basically it, because all the options are saying at least two of them are correct. So let's just do it. Um, we know that here is the, the triangle we're going to use. It's whenever you do um, projectile motion, the first thing you need to do is get the two components of launch. That angle is 15 and it's 56. So doing that, what do we get as the, um, the initial Y motion, please? It's going to be U sine, that's 56, sine 15. What's that? 14.5. 14.5. Thank you. And UX is 56 cos 15. And what's that equal to? 50? 54. Okay. And these are meters per second, obviously. Okay. Now, to find time of flight, to so time of flight, we'll use Vy equals Uy plus Ayt. And we know at the top of the flight it's zero, and that becomes 14.5 plus negative 9.8t, giving us t as being, have we got an answer on that? t would equal 14.5 divided by 9.8. The two negatives cancel, giving us with. What's that value? So that should be around about 1.5. Now, remember this is the time to the top of the flight. So we are finding it to there. This is a ground-to-ground -ground projection, so therefore we need to double it to find the time of flight. So time of flight equals 2 lots of 1.5, which is 3 seconds. So the time of flight is correct. Okay. Now, we've got the time of flight, let's go straight to the range. The range, our formula for range, is equal to the time of flight times ux, x, sorry. And we know it's 1.5, oh no, sorry, it's like 3, and ux is 54. 3 times 54 is? 160. Sorry? 160, is it? Yes, sir. Um, when I did that, I got 162, and then that, and then I. Um, is this time of flight exactly three? 
No, it was, no. it's 1.47, but then that's what I got as like the And also yeah. it's like 54.09. Oh, 50.09 as well, is it? Yeah. Okay, right. So you've got to be quite accurate here, okay? Yeah, no, I got a, I got a different answer. I got 162.27, and then that made me put A, so I didn't get D. Well, you have to now check whether or not... You have to use all the full decimals, no yeah. rounding at all. Yeah. You have to use no rounding. Yeah. No rounding is allowed. The only time it's rounded, I think, is for these values here, they're being rounded to the nearest. Okay? But to get them, you can't round at any stage for. Um, now, the maximum height, let's just do that to prove that it can't be... Um, this here, 2 is definitely going to be wrong. So let's um, have a look at that. To, to maximum height, we'll use vy squared equals uy squared squared uh, plus 2ay um, delta r. Change in um, distance. Now, this here is the distance that we want. Now, why am I not using r? Why am I not going to use r? Formula. That's the R equals UT plus a half AT squared. Why am I not going to use that formula? Because you found what Right, yes, we just found T. Okay? So we're going to use the, um, this formula here, and this will be the maximum height. Maximum height occurs when this equals zero. So we say zero equals UY is... Um, 14.5, but we'll, I'm just going to write down as 56 sine 15 squared. It's probably best to keep it mathematically tight like that. Plus 2 times negative 9.8, um, and this will be the maximum height, which will say delta R. So the height, maximum height, would equal 56 squared sine squared 15 over... 2 times 9.8. Um, so we just take this value here, square it, and then divide it by um, 19.6. And what do I get as a value? Was it? 10.7? Oh, it's the answer D, is it? Oh, sorry, yeah, it's two. So all three are correct. Sorry, I misread that as question two saying it's okay. Right, moving on to question four now. Okay, very proud of this, this one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Google. And I should have given a Creative Commons um, uh, thing about clicking this. This one here is showing that a person is walking from X, um, I'll put X on here, X is that point there, all the way to Y in a straight line. So they have to move up and over the mountain. Okay? And simply, um, at the top of the, of the mountain, what would happen to her G? Right, so? It's decreased. So G is less, is least here, and it's maximum in this little, there's a little divot down here. So this it's here is max, and it's also maximum over here. But that should be a bit less. Okay. So we're looking for a graph that will have G as the least at, in this position here, and maximum there and there. So it's got to look like that. So it's a very simple process to choose which of the three graphs it will have to be. And the only two which match any um, type of shape that would be worthwhile are A or B, and B is the one that matches our criteria. C is, this is testing whether or not you knew that G, the gravitational field vector, 9.8, does vary on the surface of the Earth, doesn't it? That's that. But, um, dot point content. Um, if you chose C, then you're thinking, well, it doesn't change at all. 
That's not true. We know if we go on a plane, we get less. But it's, is it significantly less? No. C is a valid answer if you are looking at it from a macro scale. Is that? But zooming in, there'll be slight variation. But we're not told, it does say which is the best, and she is very accurately taking these measurements. But it did say she was using a, an accelerometer to do this. Okay, so it is B. Got it. Moving on. Now, um, I have to say this is the poorest of all of your answers. So let's go through what um, one here happens. Okay, so um, I think you chose the distractor which says, here I am, hello, choose me, choose me, choose me. You, this is probably the one which requires, so, uh, you can either do it by logic and therefore you can choose it quite quickly or you can do it by calculation and you get the, the right answer straight away. Okay. A satellite, who cares what its name is, I just made that up, is originally in a geostationary orbit, or orbit around the Earth. It is now moved to an orbit that is half this um, radius. Uh, the period of the lower orbit is, and nearly universally all of you said B. 12 hours. So you're telling me that here is the, um, the sun, here is the Earth, the Earth has 365 days, that if there was a planet directly halfway between us and the, um, uh, the sun, you would have a period of 12, um, of half of our year, a half year. It doesn't do that, does it? It varies according to this law, r cubed on t squared. It's not a linear relationship. It's a, a square. It's a it's a three on two indice relationship. Okay. A equals g m on four pi squared, which we know is a constant because it's around the same object. Okay. So let's work out how would I go about doing this. Firstly, can we do it by logic? Let's do it by logic. Logic is the way I wanted you to do it. Firstly, can it be 12 hours? Because we know that it's not real, 12 hours is rubbish. If you halve the distance of an orbit, it doesn't halve the period. In fact, it's quite a complicated cube square root ratio. Can it be longer than the original um, time? No. Okay. Now, my only problem is I've got to work out whether or not it should be eight and a half hours or five hours and 41 minutes. Uh, sorry, 15 hours, 41 minutes. Okay. So A and C are still quite possible. Okay. I just don't know whether or not it's more than half or less than half. Okay. Um, if you have to choose now, you've got a one in two ch chance, but it cannot be B. So let's now work out mathematically what are our options. Oops, sorry, just get that. Okay. Now you have to do one of these in the blue book at some stage, so could we please make sure that we either copy down the working for this or somewhere and you study how it's done. There have been two um, HSCs very similar to this questions. We know that um, for any the R cubed on T squared is equal to a constant. As long as the, all of the satellites that are in orbit are around the same central object. Okay. So, we're now going to say this must equal r cubed on t squared when we change the orbit. So r, we're going to say r is the original value. So this over here, this r here is the second r. That's the smaller r. So that's going to be replaced now with a half r. Okay. Are we okay with that? It's the original r. We've got our 
Earth. Here is the radius of orbit. There is our satellite. It's now moved down to half R. I know that this period over here is 24. It's 24 hours. Um, this, because I'm using K and I'm not using G and M's and all that, I can put numbers in here which are not metric or not SI because I'm using the K. So I'm going to put that in as 24 then. So that becomes 24 squared. And since that equals k and k equals that, then these two things must just simply be equal. Where r is the original, this is the same, this is r, this is the same r, this is now half r. So re, just expanding that out, before I do anything, that becomes r cubed on 24 squared would equal 1 eighth r cubed on t squared. Happy with the half being cubed becomes one eighth. What is common to both sides that goes cancelled is the r cubed. Now cross multiplying, we get t squared equals one eighth times r, uh, one eighth times twenty four squared. Remember, this is measuring in hours. So the answer we're going to come out again will be in hours. Just solve that now and square root and we find what t is. Eight point four eight or eight point five hours. Remember, in all of these cases, it does say choose the best answer. It doesn't have to be the most. It's got to be the most correct. That's all it is. It doesn't have to be exactly correct. So it's most correct. So it's eight point five hours. So it is. A. Okay. Did you realise that you had to do that amount of work for this? Who just chose thinking that you can choose by inspection? Okay. You needed to be able to do that. So could you please, if you didn't get that one there, could you copy down that as a, what, tonight as homework and copy it down, um, repeat the process and see that it makes sense. Especially why can I use, in this case, can I put 24 in there and I don't have to convert that to seconds? Normally I'd have to convert that to seconds, wouldn't I? Because I'm using G, M and a little M, because it's kilograms, metres and seconds and so on. But because I'm using it the K form, I do not need to do that. I get my answer out. Okay. Right, number six, there's a bit of debate going on at the moment and I might have to, before your HSC, just run you through a bit more depth of the slingshot manoeuvre. The slingshot manoeuvre in the syllabus itself says you only have to identify what it does. You do not really need to do anything more than that, but I think there is a push that they really want you to start trying to outline and maybe a little bit explain, which is going to be quite difficult to explain it. But anyway... At the moment, it just says, so you've got to go identify it. So this is an identification of what one here is a slingshot manoeuvre, also known as a planetary flyby. Nothing to do with Coles supermarkets. Okay. So it's a method by which a spacecraft gains velocity by transferring some of the planet's momentum to the craft, loses velocity. Do I have to write any further? Read any further? No. Gains gravitational potential energy by transferring it from the planet to the craft. Can we do that? No, it's a bit more word salady. Um, is A still, that's, the, that's basically here, isn't it? A is the definition, isn't it? Uh, B, uses a planet's magnetic field, no, stop there. Okay. <laughs> um, it does say the planet through flyby here, just to see if, you, if you're getting, oh, it is flyby, yeah. So for people who are skim reading, they'll choose D because they see the word planet through flyby. That's all it's um, doing there. It was quite a low banded question, that one. Okay, uh, a lot of people found this question difficult. Um, do you know anything about solar activity and orbital decay? Is there any part of the course where you are to learning about solar activity and orbital decay? No. Absolutely not. What's the only cause that you know of which causes orbital decay? 
friction with particles in the upper atmosphere. Remember, our atmosphere does not have a, a line of delineation. It just thins out to very, very, very thin. Um, there's no one line which says above here be vacuum, below here be dragons. So um, that's the question. Okay, so let's have a look at what's happening. Solar activity just means more solar output. The sun is slightly hotter, it heats our atmosphere ever so slightly, our, our atmosphere expands, so there's more particles above it. And you don't need to know that. Okay? All you need to know is have a look at the shape. When there is a solar maximum, there it is, when that goes up, what happens to the K very, very quickly after? It also goes up. Okay? Here is another solar maximum, there is a thing. For every hump, there is a, um, a hump straight after. And the only reason why that could happen is, right here, so let's go down and answer, answer our questions. Which responds best? Solar activity is the major cause, is it? No. no. <laughs> You've done a whole thing about these things. It's not a major cause. It has nothing really very minor. Thing. It's just, in fact, it's just a, a curiosity that we noticed it. Um, so certain lights in a polar, uh, low Earth orbit are less susceptible to orbit. Where is that coming from? That's because I couldn't think of anything else as a distractor. Okay, it's a late night. Red wire. Don't come in. Okay, increased solar activity decreases the orbital velocity of satellites. Is that true? From this graph, is it true? Yes. Okay. So C is a possible viable. Um, Possible, yeah. Okay. But remember, you've got to choose between two options which are the best. D, solar activity increases the number of particles in the region above the Earth's atmosphere. Is that a better answer to explain it? Yes. So though C is true, D is better. And that's the lesson you need to learn from this one. D is a better choice. Okay, this is simply using um, the formula, Newton's um, universal law, that the force, the, um, the force between two spheres, the gravitational force, is equal to g m m on r squared. And I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to read you. It says in terms of g, so I'm not putting in um, six point six seven by ten to the minus. 11 in here. So you just got to work out this part here um, using the values. So it equals g 5 times 2 on 0.01 squared and whatever that comes out to be. What, uh, what answer is that one? D. D. Number nine. Okay. I got all of you. Nearly all of you. I think I did it right here. Either Mr. Millish said this is a, a I'll have to say, bastard of a question. Um, it's good, but you, yeah, you all fell for the distractor. Okay. Once again, it's your percentages that are letting you down, not your understanding of relativity. You are travelling at a velocity equaling 0.96c. At that stage, if you were to calculate your alpha factor, what is your alpha factor? It's 1 minus 0.96 squared, which is 0.28. That's where the 28% comes from, by the way. Okay. So remember, the alpha factor is a measure of the effects of relativity. There are two measures, the alpha factor and then the gamma factor. And the gamma factor is 1 on alpha. Okay? Now, sometimes you multiply by the alpha factor, sometimes you divide by it. Now, if you multiply by a percentage, you will decrease that value. If you divide by a percentage, you don't, actually, you don't increase by that value. So just take this instance. If I say I've got m, and I divide it by 0.28, am I actually increasing that by 28% increase? No. 
That's not. How do I increase by a percentage? You multiply by 1.28. That's how you increase by percentages. Okay? If you multiply by a percentage, you decrease by that percent. But if you divide by a percentage, you do not increase by that percent. You increase by miles more than that percent. And that's what got you here. So let's go through the options now. We know that the alpha factor is 28%. So let's have a look. Crafts, um, the craft appears to be reduced in length by 96%. No, it doesn't. It appears to be reduced in length by 28%, doesn't it? What's the 96? The 96 is coming from that value up there. Okay. So the people who said that the moving craft appears to be reduced in length, yes, it does, does look shorter, but it's shorter by the alpha factor. Okay, this is the correct answer, so I'm going to leave that one. The ma and this is the one that most of you chose. The mass of the cr moving craft appears to be increased. Yes, you all said that's true, but you said it was increased by 28%. When you divide... By 0.28, you do not increase the mass by 28%. You increase it by miles more than that. In fact, you're increasing it by about 300%, which is um, going to be 2. Uh, part B. The kinetic energy of the craft increased by that. Well, 96, we should have worked out 96 now. It has nothing to do with any of this. It's to do with that's the actual velocity. So anything which has 96 in it is rubbish. Okay. And also, kinetic energy has a whole series of work which is designed and uh, you need to do it. So, it's got to be B, so let's work out why it happens. Okay, so let's go time. Time will increase. So, we go and divide by 0.28, the alpha factor. Can you just have um, 1 divided by 0.28? Uh, 2.8 into your calculator. 1 divided by 0 0.28. What value do you get? 3.572. So are these two values the same? Are these two things the same? T divided by 0 0.28 is the same as 3.572. Is that right? Okay. So that's the increase in T. So this is increased by, um, it used to be uh, T, it's now 3.75 T. It's now increased by 2.57 T. That's the increase. Whole numbers in percentages are hundreds, so it's 257% increase in total. Okay. So, taking it again, if that doesn't make sense, okay. Okay, here's number five. If I divide 5 by 0 0.2, am I increasing it by 20%? No. Do the division. What is 5 divided by 0 0.2? 25. You are not increasing it by 20%. You're increasing it by miles more than that. In fact, you're increasing it by 500%. Okay? It's now increased by 20, so it's basically 400%. Okay, this is increased by 20. Are we okay with that? So this was, you were let down here by your percentages um, from year nine. Supposedly. <laughs> okay. That was not me, I didn't teach you in year nine. Okay. Well, oh, probably, uh, yes. <laughs> I did, I did most of it. My fault, me a culpa. Okay. Yes, I did most of you in year nine. Okay, right here, 10. Uh, this one's quite a straightforward one. So every now and then there is a nice straightforward one. Um, a 1.25 metre conductor, angle 30 degrees, carries that much current um, and fill strength that. What's the force of the conductor? Well, this is a magnetic force. So force equals B I L sine theta. And we just shove in the numbers. B is... 15 delta, now 50, and I still got people, it's by 10 to the minus 3 is milli, please learn them, by now you should have all got that milli is definitely by 10 to the minus 3. I is 3 amps, length is 1.25, sine of 
30. And what answer does it come out to be? Which one? Let's see. Okay, so it should come out as 9.4 by 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, a data logger measures the torque on a coil, on a DC motor, I should say, um, as it's first turned on. The data is shown before. What is the reason for this? So what two things are happening? The torque is decreasing. So let's identify the two things. Torque, so that's long symbol for torque. Torque is decreasing and the frequency of rotation is also going down. It's slowing, isn't it? Okay. What's the indicator that the, the um, it's getting slower? Sorry? Yeah, these are getting bigger. So it used to be it was moving quite fast, but now this part here, these are all the same. So these are now means it starts spinning very, very fast and slows down and then comes to a constant speed. Okay, so then Okay. We know that this happens because of what effect? Back in. Okay, so it's simply Thing. Now, this is where I have enjoyable times with my word salad. Okay? The magnetic field produced by the permanent magnets in the motor decreases, the, um, decreases after the motor is turned on. The magnetic field in the, perm in the, in the magnets gets decreased. Aren't they permanent magnets? They can't decrease. Okay. Back EMF decreases the net input current through the coil. That's the answer. Remember, sometimes the shortest is the most concise. Lenz's law gets replaced by Faraday's law after the motor is turned on by decreasing the coil's speed and consequently the torque of the coil. Sometimes there's too many words. It's you know see, it's like, that's the reason why it's called word salad. Okay? It's, it, the more you say, it makes it sound really good. Uh, come on, guys. Um, and last one here. Because you do back the EMF and eddy currents very, very close together, uh, that's the reason why often these come together. Any currents in the armature cause electric braking of the coil? No, nothing to do with electric braking, okay? Actually, there is an argument that you could think about it. Anyway, not Okay, 12, I think everyone got this correct. Um, so what happens here is the diagram shows the permanent magnet moving from here. Thanks, Gladys. Um, in and then back, um, and we're doing that. Sorry, no, it's not and back. It's just um, in, isn't it? So that's gone. At a velocity z, and we are told that the um, the galvanometer to flex to the right. Okay, we're now pulling it back at two v. What will it now do? It will deflect to the left and at a greater amount because it's a greater jump. So I think everyone got that one. Well, what um, res response was that? D. 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 Yes, the galvanometer is deflected to the left more than one unit. Okay. We can't say it's two. Okay, three. Um, this one here required not too much calculation, but some calculation. So three wires of equal length are parallel and have current travelling in the same direction. Um, there they are. I don't need to describe it all because the picture spans a thousand words. Okay. What is a possible combination of the current in R and the distance that will give a net force of zero? Now, P and Q are travelling in the same direction. So are they going to repel or come together? Right there, going to come together, okay? So we need we need a pull this direction from R, which is the same as the pull this way. So let's work out what the pull between P and Q are together. P and Q is together, otherwise you think I'm saying the letter R. Right, the force between two conductors, or force per um, length, is equal to K I1, I2 on D. Are we okay with that? Why am I using um, P 
per length. Well, we are not given the length of these conductors, but they're all the same. So that's just not needed. So that's K, we don't care what K is, and that's 5 times 2, and the distance is 0 0.202. Can I just get you to calculate 5 times 2 divided by 0.2 there, please? Was it? Right, it's 500k. Are we okay with that? So there is a pool of 500k this way. Right, now I'm going to um, do the same pool that way. So the other combination is this, it's k i1 by 2 on D. Now I1 is already 5 amps and then I2 is what we need and the distance is D. Okay. So what do I need? I need this value here to equal this value here. So let's make them equal. So equating them, that's K5I over D must equal 500 K. So cancelling the K's on both sides, cancelling the 5's, I on D must equal 100. So now we have to choose. We need an I, which is the X current. So going down, I'll just, sorry, just go down a bit so we can see the options. We need, this is the current. And this is the distance. We need the value in here to be divided by the value in here and equal 100. Which of the options is the only thing? It's only A that works. Okay. Please remember, if you're having difficulty with these ones, please have a, a re-go at them and make sure that you understand the math needs behind it. Okay, um, this one here is determining the, I won't take more than a few seconds, um, the uh, definition between magnetic field strength and magnetic flux. Only one of them is the correct definition. Most of it's word salad. And um, the letter is, which one? B. Is it B? B. So just for the, people, for the folks at home, it's B. All the others are variants but got something wrong in them. Okay. And the last one here is if you were to, um, there's the uh, EMF, and it says we're now going to spin the coil at twice. If you spin the coil twice as fast, then the amplitude, the EMF, will also go twice as fast or um, double. But the other thing that happens is because it's spinning twice as fast, um, it's a higher frequency. So the frequency has to double, and the amplitude also has to double. So the only option for that one is C. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. We'll go back to our normal broadcast um, next lesson.